The case study uh, here uh, that will be shortly uh, seen on the slides uh, is the case study of Burundi. Now you might know this, this sort of case study as a situation that the International Criminal Court is investigating right now. It is early, in the early stages and it has been in the early stages of the investigation for uh, quite a long time. And my idea or my proposal to this panel is whether this subject can be hijacked sort of for the purposes of bringing peacekeepers to justice for international crimes if they have committed those international crimes. Now, at a glance, I would just like to uh, present the uh, two, two or three general things about Burundi so that we can understand the situation inside the country, and then we'll move on to what sort of acts were uh, happening in Burundi between 2015 and 2017, and then we'll see the legal situation or sort of the legal swamp or quagmire uh, that the ICC is seemingly in. And I say seemingly because I do believe that this is not such a, a legal quagmire, but more like a series of political decisions that need to be taken at this point. And the legal situation is, I think, relatively speaking, clear. And then I will leave you to make up your own conclusions about the uh, matter at hand. So what do we need to know about uh, Burundi? I understand that the audience is, is widely ranging from, uh, from uh, experts on the subject to those who, who uh, have who didn't have the opportunity to study the uh, state of Burundi, so, ju so just three things that worth um, mentioning here. Firstly, Burundi is not widely known for its uh, high democratic standards. Based on uh, various rankings by NGOs, it has been listed as a hard autocracy meaning that there are no free and fair elections, there are significant uh, curbs in human rights when it comes to the uh, uh, country itself. It hasn't been granted a gracious situation on that uh, uh, pedestal. It basically has an authoritarian regime since the unrests in 2005 onwards. And what is especially telling for us, and this is going to be quite important in the, in the long run, is the state of the judiciary and the rule of law standards inside the country. Now, if I can just read a few uh, excerpts from the uh, latest 2022 Freedom House report, it says that the judiciary is hindered by corruption and the lack of resources and, and the training, but even uh, a bit worse, the judiciary is subservient to the executive, which regularly interferes in the criminal justice system, and the, judi and the judiciary is also used for uh, 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 the persecution of the political opposition. Furthermore, the, the constitutional guarantees of due process are generally not upheld. Arbitrary arrest and lengthy prison, uh, um, pretrial detention are common. So what we can deduct from this is the judicial system is not free and fair, which will have an impact on complementarity and whether the, the ICC can expect Burundi to initiate domestic uh, uh, criminal processes against its own citizens. Uh, now, Burundi had its fair share of domestic crises in the middle of the uh, 2000s, similarly to a lot of uh, African countries. However, why this situation is uh, a bit specific uh, is because uh, from this moment on, Burundi has more or less stabilized. It has evaded becoming a failed state and itself has participated in peace operations since then. Now, the uh, peace operation in Burundi only lasted around two, or th uh, two and a half and, and three years. It was concluded in uh, 2006. And ever since then, the country has been participating in, uh, in peace operations in nearby countries. Now, this is, of course, according to uh, UN principles. It's not a neighboring country in, in, in these conflicts. It does not have a direct vested interest in those conflicts. However, stating that the country is purely participating in peace operations out of altruistic reasons would be a far stretch. Why? Because it has several hundreds of troops uh, uh, being stationed in, for example, the uh, Central African Republic, and it receives a, a large amount of money from the UN for this purpose. It can be stated that for uh, Burundi, it has a sort of double purpose. On the one hand, it is financing its military uh, uh, with a, a contribution of around 25% from the UN. And on the other hand, it is also, let's say, providing a job for its uh, own military not to be stationed at home and not to be, let's say, left without work, left to uh, change the, the domestic structures of the uh, uh, country itself. So as you can see from the map, it's not exactly far away from Burundi. 
but you have to tra uh, traverse the DRC, the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which itself houses a, a peace operation, one of the uh, more, more uh, controversial ones. So the area itself, the zone itself, as we see from the uh, large amount of cases coming from that area, is, an, is uh, not ideal when it comes to uh, international uh, criminal cases. So what did these peacekeepers do? Bear in mind that the investigation that is currently taking place regarding Burundi is not regarding peacekeepers, so this is just a hijacking of, of that case. It is concerning the events that have taken place in Burundi by Burundian citizens. Although the investigation is not exactly, let's say, phased like that, but we'll get back to it in, in, in a moment. So what peacekeepers have done is that they have abused their uh, status as protectors of the uh, civilian population, as guardians of the innocent, and they have committed several serious violations, mainly of sexual nature, against the uh, local population. Now, according to the UN's own numbers, we have 43 cases. 43 reported allegations against peacekeepers. This does not say that these acts happened. It does not mean that we have one perpetrator against one victim. It does not mean that we do not have a large number of underlying cases that went uh, uh, unreported. Why? Because in a lot of these situations, underreporting is a, is a persistent phenomenon. Uh, when we did have empirical studies in Haiti, for example, in the early 2010s, and in Cambodia back in the 1990s, we could see that the actual number of cases is around 15 to 30 times as much as the ones that have been uh, reported by the official UN documents. So this is going to be a, a pertaining issue. Now, what has been substantiated since 2015 were cases of uh, sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, most notably rape, and in one of the cases in which the UN has completely, let's say, uh, investigated, there was a, a case of rape against a minor. Now, I regret to say, but this is nothing of a novelty, because when it comes to UN peace operations, we have over 100 cases per year that, can that uh, is tackling the issue of sexual exploitation and abuse. Why the situation <coughs> in Burundi is a bit uh, different is because Burundi's government is implicitly involved to a certain de degree. And if this formulation sounds shady and blurry enough for you, that's, that's intentional. That's because we do not know what the government has been saying or doing regarding these uh, peacekeepers. Now allegedly, and this is just allegedly leaked information and uh, uh, hallway uh, uh, hearsay, they have encouraged and supported these kinds of action not specifically sexual exploitation and abuse, but they have said to the uh, peacekeepers there that due to the economic strain in the country, you can uh, feel free to do whatever you want. You can loot, you can exploit, you can grab what you can and bring it home to reinforce our own ailing economy. Now, this is not an explicit saying that you can commit sexual exploitation and abuse, but if we compare it, uh, if we uh, uh, contrast it to the notions that there have not been criminal procedures against peacekeepers in the country that we know of uh, uh, so far since uh, um, 2015, two, uh, 2017, and that the government is not doing anything while also implicitly supporting these acts, encouraging them, endorsing them, and ruling out the possibility of a domestic criminal, criminal process, it raises certain questions. It raises the questions of whether these crimes will, will not just be, let's say, serious crimes in domestic criminal law, but maybe these will reach the level of international crimes. Now, there are two international crimes that can be uh, uh, addressed here, war crimes and the crimes against humanity. Now, regarding the actual act that has happened, for example, rape, uh, we have a, a widening court practice, widening jurisprudence on, on the uh, matter as enshrined in the uh, Antigonda case that has been referenced several times today and uh, yesterday as well, and lately in the uh, Ongwen case. So the court is finding its own robust voice on that matter. However, the questionable thing, and I do not want to take away the, the prosecutor's job, and I don't want to get into the uh, guessing game either, proving that this has been as, as required by war crimes, part of a plan or a policy or, uh, or uh, taking part of a large-scale commission of the conduct would require investigations on the ground, uh, uh, getting, to contact, well, uh, getting into contact uh, with uh, uh, victims and conducting a thorough investigation that could take uh, uh, quite a lot of time. But 
it can be uh, proven, at least from an outsider's point of view. Crimes against humanity might be a bit, um, diff a bit more difficult to prove, uh, as it would require a systematic attack directed against uh, any civilian population. And I think this is a much higher threshold that would be way harder to, to, to uh, approve. Uh, at this moment, I think it is doubtful that we have reached this level and, and whether this uh, can be uh, proven. However, uh, we, we do have a discrepancy here. Uh, these are the peacekeepers, uh, the individual ground soldiers who are committing these acts. And the ICC is not exactly interested in the privates, in the uh, ordinary members of the armed forces. It is interested in the so-called so the bigger fish and the middle-sized fish in the, in the pond. So those who are issuing orders or those who are in a command position to do anything about uh, these acts. Um, and, and this is where the ICC could make its uh, mark because if this conduct has been condoned by the government or even implicitly encouraged by high-ranking officials, then there's a fair chance that uh, we do have evidence of it. We, we can uh, acquire testimonials and these <clears throat> uh, can be proven further down the line. Now this sounds very, let's say, easy to understand so far, at least I, I, I hope I have presented that picture. However, uh, we, we do need to take a look at how the uh, ICC can operate in this uh, legal situation. Firstly, do we have some sort of contact or cooperation between the UN and the ICC? Of course we have. The UN is one of the most avid supporters of, of uh, uh, the, the ICC. But furthermore, since its inception in 2014, every single mandate that the uh, peace operation in, in the Central African Republic had, had a clause indicating cooperation with the ICC. So the UN is, let's say, allowing and encouraging cooperation between its own peace operation and the International Criminal Court. And it's also a, a, a quite pleasant uh, thing that the Central African Republic is, of course, a state party to the Rome Statute. Uh, and as we have seen from several referrals fr from the Central African Republic, it is actively relying on the ICC to do what it cannot, be, uh, to do what, uh, it cannot do on its own. Uh, now, here comes the bit, a bit of a difficult part. The, uh, for the ICC, we do have some restrictions regarding its jurisdiction, as you are uh, uh, qu uh, quite aware of. For these operations, we do have a net of legal rules, as enshrined in status of forces agreements and memorandum, memoranda of understanding between the host state and the UN, and the UN and the sending state. And these all share one similarity, they have a provision for exclusive criminal jurisdiction for the sending state, which means that in these cases, as much as the Central African Republic would like to do anything, as much as the UN would like to get in and, and to do anything, it is only Burundi that will have exclusive criminal jurisdiction, which is going to complicate things uh, uh, by a bit. So what can the UN do? Is it a toothless dragon? Not exactly, because in these cases, as a preventative measure to evade the wrath of the local population, the UN encourages repatriation of the alleged perpetrator. And even without encouragement, the countries are withdrawing their forces quite often or initiating a different round of troops to arrive into that country uh, if they have been implicated in these actions for fear of retribution or retaliation from the local population even without being substantiated. Uh, uh, the, the, the mere allegation is enough for the uh, repatriation and the withdrawal. Now, pressure has been mounting on the UN for several years now. There have been several NGOs, such as the Code Blue movement, that is pressuring, putting pressure on the UN to make sure that they are investigating these acts, they're taking them seriously, they're not forgetting that these acts are happening. But so far, the UN didn't uh, exactly go besides uh, 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 or beyond this uh, point. And as we have seen, domestic process in Burundi is uh, quite elusive. It is, it is not a, uh, a guarantee at all. So can we rush things by a, a, a UN Security Council referral? It is quite unlikely at, at this moment, uh, which has two main reasons. Uh, one is economic, the other is security. Uh, China has very good ties with uh, Burundi, especially regarding its gold mining activities, so it is likely to veto any s such proposal. And uh, Russia, even in the last one or two years, have had, let's say, <coughs> 
has provided some degree of security related aid to the country and the ties between uh, the uh, president of Burundi and the uh, Russian leadership remain strong. So a Security Council referral remains uh, quite elusive to this day. So what can Burundi do if we have arrived to the point that it has exclusive criminal jurisdiction in, in the case? Burundi, uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, has been a state party to the Rome Statute. However, it has also withdrawn its, its uh, uh, signature in 2017, akin to the Philippines, uh, um, for instance. However, the timeline here might be a bit deceiving uh, because uh, before the withdrawal came into effect, Exactly two days before it, the Office of the Prosecutor has announced that they are launching an investigation, opening up possibilities for the ICC, even though uh, the uh, withdrawal came into effect by the end of October. And the investigation is quite specific. I have my doubts that they had peacekeepers in mind, but still it was formulated as such as that uh, uh, crimes against humanity allegedly committed both in, uh, in uh, and outside of Burundi by Burundian nationals uh, between 2015 and 2017 will be investigated, which is quite ideal if the ICC wishes to uh, uh, continue with the uh, idea of prosecution because Burundian nationals have actually committed these acts outside of Burundi, which falls uh, uh, in, in the scope. Now this, as I have uh, iterated several times will be hijacking uh, to, to a certain degree this investigation, but it falls under the scope of the investigation, so why not expand it? So if we were to, strictly speaking, look at the uh, jurisdiction of the ICC, we can say that it's more likely to be uh, warranted here. The material jurisdiction, if we stop at the level of the war crimes, is quite likely. Temporal <coughs> jurisdiction, as we have seen, just a bit, but it still uh, falls uh, under the scope of the uh, uh, statute. But regarding personal and territorial uh, jurisdiction, they were the citizens of Burundi when it was committed, so the active personal uh, pr principle applies, but the territorial uh, principle would also apply here. Complementarity might be a bit uh, sketchy. However, if we t take it into consideration that for at least six years, Burundi has done nothing to uh, prosecute its own uh, uh, citizens for these violations, then I believe that the complementarity uh, a pr a principle can be invoked as the state in question did nothing. And even if they did, it might be akin to what the uh, uh, Rome Statute considers shielding as the executive is directly relying on the military Thank you. Uh, uh, directly relying on its military to control the uh, population and sometimes to, to even either appoint or to intimidate uh, members who are working in the uh, justice system. So the jurisdiction of the ICC remains relatively clear. Now, and this is where it gets a bit political. This is where we have to uh, evaluate the uh, uh, politicization of the uh, ICC. What are the pros? What are the cons? What would be the effects and the ramifications if we were to launch such a, a, a process? It would mean, of course, justice for the victims. Uh, it, it could mean the participation of the victims in those uh, um, um, processes before uh, the uh, ICC, they could uh, benefit from the, the trust fund, they could receive reparation, uh, it might act as, a, de as, as a, a deterrence against future perpetrators, and it would not rely on the um, relatively biased domestic courts of uh, uh, Burundi. Not to mention not, uh, taking note of these events, registering what has happened so that uh, it is a, a testament to future. However, for, uh, from the UN's point of view, the organization is, is often charged with being quite partial, with protecting uh, its own even when they are charged with serious crimes. And I believe that this would do a lot to remedy the UN's image as an organization that does not only preach the uh, rule of law and accountability, but who also acts in favor of it. However, we have to admit that there are several quite strong arguments against having such processes against peacekeepers uh, before the ICC. The first one is participation and cooperation. And these might not sound negative at first, but we, we, we have to note here that 193 UN member states participate to a certain degree in peace operations. The ICC does not boast this unanimous background of state support. And when it comes to investigating their own citizens, states are even more reluctant. We have had some examples of France, for example, yesterday, being the prodigal child of the ICC. Thank you. 
one more minute, uh, if, if, if I may be so bold. Uh, however, when it came to investigating the conduct of French peacekeepers in the Central African Republic, they basically threw out the cases of the window, saying that evidence could not be gathered according to the French Penal Code, and as a result, these were unsubstantiated claims. So cooperation, when it comes to criminal matters against their own citizens, might not be as, as widespread as um, uh, um, possible. Access to perpetrators, these are citizens of Burundi. As we have seen, they can be repa uh, repatriated at any moment. So actually having a grasp over them uh, would be quite a uh, uh, far stretch. And due to time constraints, I would only highlight one uh, thing. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the key element that has been stopping the UN and stopping the, the, the ICC also. It would have major political ramifications for the future of the UN and, and, and for peace operations. Because when we be, uh, begin to, let's say, uh, uh, issue arrest warrants against high-ranking uh, uh, officials involved in peace operations, then the states would simply ask the question, OK, is it worth it for me anymore to, to participate in peace operations? I'm, I'm risking my own citizens, I'm risking my, my own soldiers. If I'm dragged before the ICC for something, uh, that would be detrimental to my image. So it's a safe bet to not to be involved in, in peace operations anymore. And I believe that this is what the, the UN fears also, that states will be much more reluctant to participate in peace operations if their own soldiers would be uh, dragged uh, uh, before the ICC. Uh, and as a concluding remark, uh, tying to the uh, theme of the conference, what are the lessons learned, might have learned, and unlearned, uh, we have seen from this that uh, the UN is also having the strong opinion that bringing uh, peacekeepers before the ICC would not be a, a good idea. What we might have learned from, uh, from the process of the ICC is that even an acquittal, like we have seen in the uh, Bambo Gambo uh, case, can have positive effects. For example, one of my uh, learned colleagues from the Netherlands has made a, a study in, in this regard, and he has found out that his political connections, his influence, and his chances of being elected in the Congo have been significantly worsened uh, uh, because his name was dragged through the ICC, and this was a recurring topic during the election uh, process. So the deterrence uh, value of even so, of someone who's acquitted might be a, a lesson learned by the uh, ICC. And the lesson that has been unlearned or that is sometimes seemingly lost behind the political uh, aspirations here is a phrase, if we are back to the uh, 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 highly trendy uh, uh, quotes here, attributed to Nelson Mandela, but also paraphrased by current Secretary General Antonio Guterres, that only justice can uh, bring peace. And if uh, we are, let's say, not remembering this lesson uh, well, then we are not remembering why the ICC was set up in, in 1998 in the first place. I will not read it out loud. This is just a, just a, uh, a victim's testimonial that has been widely circulated in 2017, which sheds a light on the trauma, on the uh, suffering that has been suffered as a result of these actions by the civilian population. And I think due to all of the politicizing that, 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 that might occur on the level of the UN and on the level of the ICC, these are the facts that will always have to be in the back of our minds when we are in a position to make these decisions. I know I have exhausted my time frame, so apologies for that. Uh, and I'm very much open to questions, and I hope I could provoke you to a certain degree. Thank you very much.